Well, as promised, this is the first of two videos covering the history of Cyprus. There is just so much to cover. Uh, sometime in the future, we'll have a chance to stretch our legs and get into detail about the Neolithic on Cyprus, which is quite something. It's also fascinating for just how much it's got going on in the Bronze Age, including, but not limited to, a ton of finds and artistic works to see. But I have to keep telling myself this is a summary. We are just going to hard cut around the 20 minute mark. I'm gonna have to admit my biases up front. These episodes have a definite bias towards sites where there's more to see and film. But I don't know how much heavy lifting you're expecting us to do with the minutiae of like dating fossilized pollen grains or high level academia on the topic. I mean, look, big ups to everyone who's putting work in at that level. We're just doing our best, okay? Listing sources as much as possible. A lot of the time, we're just gonna include the museum cards in the bottom right for dating citations. Every so often it just makes my head spin how Cyprus is running on a completely different clock than ancient Britain. I mean, point of reference, Britain in 7000 BC. What's left? Like, if I want to get a sense of it, what can I see? Well, I mean, we've got some flint fragments, some axes and microliths. That's what you've got. The inhabitants of Britain were essentially living in shelters that we'd consider pretty basic. And that's not to throw shade, this was because they were moving around a lot more, exploiting whatever foods were abundant in the landscape, so putting down roots could spell starvation if your food source is finite or seasonal. So when you're in Cyprus, I can't help but get a bit giddy to see the remains of dwellings that go back as far as 9,000, even as much as 10,000 years, and these structures are still there, right in front of your eyes, which is what we have at Calavasos Tenta. There's a tedious but understandable template that some newspaper articles like to run with, um, X discovery or structure that is older than Stonehenge. <sighs> but if we're going by that particular metric, the earliest occupation levels with actual architecture visible on Cyprus are about as far before Stonehenge as we are after it. The structures on Calavasos Tenta have to be sheltered from the elements, as many of them are mud brick, and although it's actually several layers of buildings, sometimes in stone, sometimes in mud, we believe the absolute earliest occupation may have been in wooden structures, which, you know, aren't there anymore. Now, you don't have to be a scholar of antiquity to track. If we're talking about a culture that isn't firing ceramic pottery yet, we are early. So we call this the aceramic or pre-pottery Neolithic. And not at all far away, contemporary with Calabasos being established just slightly later, this is Hierokitia. And not only do we have some fantastic remains of the settlement in situ on the hillside, they've actually gone to the trouble of reconstructing them. And this isn't just a quick theme park job for the visitors, they've really gone out of their way to replicate original materials and conditions. So the Hirokitia culture, based on the material that survived in the archeology, span they're making dwellings with dimensions conjectured to be around two to three meters in height. We've got a fair confidence they're also flat roofed and we believe the houses were whitewashed with Havara, which is a white chalky sediment. And they're not just putting up these round structures, they are planning and building their settlements very deliberately, including this staircase, which, yeah, at first doesn't look like anything to get too excited about, but this is actually part of a defensive work that controls access to the settlement. And despite the fact it's under a shelter and at risk of pretty much just melting away, this staircase actually survives in situ. So what were the Hirokitia culture doing? Well, plant gathering and hunting, including possibly boar, which we believed was introduced from the mainland. At Calavasos, they were herding goats and pigs, but no cattle yet. And there is also cereal cultivation happening, like with this iron corn wheat. While only this diagram survives, we know they were painting with red ochre, and uh, these figures were painted on the walls of a structure at Calavasos. So these guys are making all manner of artistic objects, and hey, I mean, even just the more prosaic and practical items like those stone containers, they're pretty amazing. Those would have taken significant work and craftsmanship to make. Anyway, in most of Europe, you're very rarely gonna see much architecture that gets back beyond 4000 BC. So to witness sites this old is truly very exciting. And considering these cultures are way ahead of what was happening at the same time in Northern Europe, it might surprise you that around 6000 BC, habitation appears to cease. We have a noticeable gap in the archeological record for maybe up to 1,500 years. Now, both the size and particular reasons for this gap are very much up for debate. But Hirokitia, for example, seems to have been abandoned peacefully around 6000 BC. 
When we next pick up the story again, not only are we now making pottery, but Cypriot pottery is soon going to go absolutely wild. Like, you've got to see some of the stuff they are producing in Bronze Age. But before we get there, the Chalcolithic period. Now, sometimes it's difficult to determine if the Chalcolithic is really a thing, or if it's just a transitional culture between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. Ugh, there seems to be this particular niche in boomer humour for jokes specifically about the quote Stone Age changing to the Bronze Age overnight. Like, yes. <laughs> what an amazing premise for humour you've discovered. But yes, the Chalcolithic period is some of the earliest uses of copper, but before bronze smelting had become widespread. And yes, it's something that comes in gradually. While we're talking about copper, this is going to be one of the things that is most significant in the history of Cyprus. And while we're not entirely sure of the original etymology for the name Cyprus, it might have been in reference to copper. In later centuries, Latin speakers would refer to copper as the metal of Cyprus, cuprum. Hence, it's still CU on the periodic table. And this is one of the reasons Cyprus was so significant in the Bronze Age as the supply of this incredibly precious resource. The Luberan shipwreck off the coast of Turkey, which is one of the most significant finds we have in terms of understanding trade relationships in the later Bronze Age. The ship may have sailed from a port on Cyprus or possibly on the Syrian coast, but it contained 10 tons of copper, which was mostly or entirely from Cyprus, as well as some Cypriot pottery and lamps. Now, I feel like I'm talking down to my audience here if I have to specify that bronze is an alloy of copper and tin, but there's every possibility that the average person doesn't know that. And just bear in mind that the mixture is normally about 88 to 12% copper to tin, so you are needing plenty of copper to go into that mixture. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Winding back to the Chalcolithic a second, at this early stage, we have a snapshot of this culture at Lemper. Again, it's another Cypriot site that has been reconstructed, which is always a massive treat. These are the hut circles that have survived. Now, the people at Lempa are doing all kinds. They're cultivating seeds, but they're also hunting and fishing. And much to my surprise, they're also great manufacturers of jerry cans. Yeah, all this nearly 5,000 years before we'd synthesized plastic in modern times. Truly an advanced civilization. Lempa was abandoned around 2400 BC, when we're well into the Bronze Age. And based on the art we find, the culture on Cyprus is flourishing. Few highlights. We have these rather surreal plank figurines from around this time. These are overly stylized figures that may be the focus of worship, particularly in regards to fertility. Uh, there's all sorts going artistically. Um, this is red polished ware with incised decorations. You can see these cuts are made before the firing process. But added to this, there are so many examples of Cypriot pottery in many lyrical and playful shapes, such as this incised pot with creatures around it. In fact, this elaborate method of wringing a pot with creatures and forms around the rim crops up all over. They get pretty wild. Now, it's one thing having trade with goods flowing in and out, but as we get to the later Bronze Age in the Aegean, you have powerful maritime cultures starting to have an outsized influence on Cyprus. For example, the exact relationship of the Minoans with their surrounding area is difficult for us to characterize. We don't know if they were engaging in hostile action to establish power bases beyond the island of Crete, if it was like a form of Bronze Age gunboat diplomacy, or maybe they extended their influence entirely peacefully. But on Cyprus, their presence is only too apparent in the language being used, and by around 1500, we have a script called Cipro Minoan, which bears a striking resemblance to the Minoan Linear A script, which sadly also means it's untranslated. You've got Minoan-style jewellery being made, uh, you've got pottery both imported and influenced from all around in ways that I've had to cut for time. But for example, check out these octopus pots. This is a style that emerges on Crete after the eruption of Thera and may represent changing attitudes towards the sea, and we're finding these on Cyprus as well. And it's no surprise at all that given its location, Cyprus was seeing a brisk maritime trade, and the proto-version of Larnaca was the ancient city of Kition, which was a significant port on the south of the island. This here is part of a temple complex as well as an external fortifying wall. And only a couple of blocks away in Larnaca, sadly through locked gates, but you can get a glimpse at the port of Kition. Uh, this is where the waterline originally came to. We already mentioned the Minoan influence on the island, but if you know anything about this time and place, you've already guessed that the Mycenaeans were not far behind. And again, we struggle to characterize just to what extent they are calling the shots on the island. If it's more collaborative with the locals, I mean, we are pretty confident in the characterization of the Mycenaeans being warlike and enthusiastic about conquest. 
but the degree to which they're controlling life on Cyprus, or whether they're just another influence, is hard to tell definitively. We certainly have a lot of pottery showing up in a very distinctive Mycenaean style. Whatever the case, a flurry of activity, including the building of the Cyclopean walls at Kittian, seems to coincide with a greater influx of Mycenaeans around the 1100s BC. Not far away, and just a couple of hundred yards from the Neolithic site of Calavasos, are the ruins of Calavasos Ius Demetrius. Now, while this is just a fraction of it, it appears to have been a planned settlement with parallel streets running north to south. And what you're mainly seeing in this footage is the ominously titled Building X, which may well have been an administrative centre for the region. On the left, what has been labelled the Pythos Hall had the remains of around 50 huge pithoi jars. We're pretty sure containing olive oil, and this could have been a major storage depot containing up to 33,000 litres of oil. You also have the site of Enkomi round on the east coast, and while you can see extensive ruins from the Bronze Age settlement, it's really the wealth of finds that sets Enkomi apart. It was one of the most significant port settlements on the island, its east-facing coast making it the focus of trade coming in from the Levant. And as well as these influences showing up from Mesopotamia, we've also got some quite unbelievable ivory finds in the tombs around Enkomi. There are some pretty phenomenal luxury goods in circulation here. I mean, take for example, this gaming box. This has to be some of the most remarkable ancient treasure found on the whole island. And the fact that it's something this beautiful, intricate, and it's not part of religious worship or some monumental royal tomb necessarily, just a beautiful gaming box, a leisure item with which to socialize and have fun. We also have a lot of Mycenaean style pottery from here and there's a truly spectacular level of copper working going on. I mean, just look at the workmanship on this, for example. Finally, on the opposite side, on the west coast, a little ways beyond modern Paphos, Ma is an intriguing site, as it's a late Bronze Age site which may have been founded by Mycenaean settlers or even refugees arriving from Greece. They built a cyclopean wall to fortify themselves on this promontory. Now, I know it doesn't look like much, you're gonna have to be a little generous with your imagination. You can see the gate is actually set at a right angle to the walls as a defensive feature. Uh, you can also see on this plan some of the dwellings at Mar, which are pretty elaborate for the time. They're kind of similar to the sort of Megara that you would find on mainland Greece. But occupation at Mar was fairly short-lived, however. By 1150, it had been burnt and abandoned. And if you're unaware of what was happening elsewhere in the Mediterranean, a minor cascade of disasters known as the Bronze Age Collapse was taking place. It appears while on the one hand the collapse of trade routes in the eastern Mediterranean must have had a significant effect on the island, at Kittian and in other places we actually have a continuity of settlement at a time when the major Mycenaean settlements on the Greek mainland for example had gone up in smoke. At Ias Demetrius, settlement appears to end, possibly because the trade that existed in the Bronze Age had dried up and the demand for copper, which had once driven activity at the settlement, no longer existed. Now, after the Bronze Age, we're gonna have to do this as a bit of a speed run because pretty much every major empire has a crack at controlling Cyprus during this period. We start off with the Phoenicians. The exact level of influence they had on the island is not clear, but they established themselves around Kittian and you can see some of the alterations they made to the site. You definitely see the influences on Cypriot art when placed side by side with Phoenician art. And perhaps most significantly, you see a change in the language. Now, the Phoenician alphabet is a big enough deal in and of itself as it went on to be copied and adapted by the Greeks and then the Romans ended up copying the Greeks. There is also another language being used alongside Phoenician called Cyprosyllabic, which I don't have a ton of time to get into. You can see both writing styles on this stele. We also know from a later inscription from the Assyrian king Esarhaddon that far from Cyprus being a single entity, it was controlled by a series of kingdoms which were a bit more like city-states, so a change to one or two does not automatically indicate a change to all. What we do know is the Phoenicians, who by the end of about 700 BC were vassals of the Assyrian Empire, they called on their Assyrian overlords to assist them in putting down rebellions on Cyprus. It seems after this that Assyrian rule would become more direct, as in the 600s BC we have recordings of 10 Cypriot kings both refitting Esarhaddon's army and also assisting with mustering Ashurbanipal's army for a conflict in Egypt. Now these are the sort of things that Assyrians would expect of their allied rulers. So by then, we're probably looking at more direct Assyrian control rather than just vicarious rule through the Phoenicians. But soon there was another status quo shift. 
Cyprus had always had close links with Egypt. This cuneiform tablet from 1350 BC was written to the pharaoh, and a distinctive Egyptian style was already a feature of many examples of Cypriot art. But sometime around or after 570 BC, Pharaoh Amasis or Ahmos II either conquered or at least claimed to have control of the island. Our source for this is Herodotus, so you've always got to squint at those. Anyway, no need to hold your breath, or if you do, you'll only have to hold it for less than 50 years because by 525, the island was under the control of the Achaemenid Persians. Now, it appears the island was surrendered to the Persians, Perhaps seeing the way the winds were blowing, and you know, not least because not far away on the mainland, most of the Phoenicians had already done so. I've seen the Persian control of the islands characterized as quite a light touch, you know, the paying of tribute, which seems to chime with how the Achaemenids were treating a lot of their territories in the 500s. However, what's always particularly difficult with Cyprus is not to take away all the agency from the population in antiquity and say, everything is derivative and influenced from the outside, or to flip the opposite way and try and argue that foreign rule never really stuck and everything is autochthonous. The truth, of course, is somewhere in the middle. The best way to describe this is that while, yes, you can point to all manner of influences from all points of the compass, east to Syria, south to Egypt, west to the Peloponnese, and north to Anatolia, the syncretism and fusion of all these influences on Cyprus would produce a unique hothouse culture, the likes of which was not matched anywhere else in the same way. Outside influence and internal conflict all persisted into the 400s as control of Cyprus went back and forth between those with Greek sympathies and the Persians reasserting control as the internal kingdoms fought, sometimes with Persian help. But wind forward to around 333 BC and Alexander the Great is tearing through the Persians and the Cypriot kingdoms renewed their rebellion against the Persians and put the formerly Persian navy at Alexander's disposal and even helped out with the siege of Tyre. We haven't spoken much about the Greek influence. Now, you need to put some mental asterisks next to that idea, as there was nothing resembling a united Greece, but the Greeks were particularly keen to spread their maritime empire from Mar to Marseille. This was not a centralized, controlled empire, but rather a network of connections where culture, and particularly language, unified a network of colonies and trade. We already mentioned the Minoan, then Mycenaean dominance of the islands, and this had a long lasting impact on the culture. I mean, all through the first millennium BC, there's still Greek influence coming through the art, but after the conquests of Alexander the Great, we enter what is described as the Hellenic period on the island. The royal tombs at Salamis were locked, so there was a limited view we could get. Those are slightly earlier. They're from about the 7 to 600s BC. We think with some as late as maybe 300s and some as early as the 1100s. One of the most remarkable monuments from the Hellenistic era and pretty much just on Cyprus in general, the tombs of the kings just outside Paphos, parentheses. No kings actually buried there as far as we can tell, but just the diversity of burials in the rocks from this site is remarkable. From monumental rock-cut tombs with incredibly grand features, uh, the purpose of many appears to be imitations of houses, mirroring a common ancient practice of tombs being seen as very literal houses for the dead. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the plots also got used as a refuge, first for Christians in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, and later as dwellings into the medieval period. Also, a surprising find from the Hellenistic period the Kyrenia shipwreck is the remains of a ship that sank off the north coast of Cyprus around Kyrenia. We know it had stopped off in Rhodes, Kos and Samos. It was carrying mainly amphorae of wine and a large quantity of almonds. And based on the date of the wood of the hull versus the dating of the almonds, it seemed like the ship was getting on a bit in age. The trees that made the hull were felled around 100 years before the day it sank. And because the hull timbers have survived remarkably well, we can actually look at some of the repairs that were being made. And the whole thing has taught us a considerable amount about shipbuilding techniques from this period. While there had been an initial scuffle to see which of Alexander's successors would control Cyprus, it became part of the Ptolemaic sphere along with Egypt. Cyprus was a valuable source of both copper and timber. And during this time, the old languages of Cyprus, including the use of Phoenician, gradually fade out of use together with the old Cypriot syllabic script, which was replaced by the Greek alphabet. Well, like just about everyone in the Eastern Mediterranean, Cyprus would have to contend with the rapid expansion of Rome. There's a fair amount to see from the success centuries of Roman rule on Cyprus. They established Paphos as a capital and you can see from the extensive ruins as well as all the mosaics there just how prosperous it was. 
On the other side of the island, its premier eastern facing port at Salamis was also flourishing. You can see there from the baths, the theatre and the forum. The New Testament describes Paul and Barnabas landing at Salamis and then travelling around the island before arriving at Paphos. And though it's not in the accounts of the New Testament, there is a tradition that Barnabas was later stoned at Salamis. And the monastery nearby has a couple of tombs, one of which may have belonged to Barnabas. Gonna reserve judgement on the authenticity there. We know of several earthquakes that hit Cyprus, and after the earthquake of 76 AD hit Curion particularly badly, Rome sent a large fund for its reconstruction. There were also particularly destructive earthquakes around the island in the 300s, and the one in 365 caused severe damage to most of the settlements on the island. But these are just a handful of destruction events in several centuries that appear to be very peaceful and prosperous. Don't have a particularly spectacular cliffhanger to leave this account on, other than to press pause until the part two is up. And on the next one, how the Byzantine population of the island would interact with Islamic invasions, Crusaders, Venetians, Ottomans, and how the modern state took shape into the 20th century. So definitely check back for that. Meanwhile, the music you've been hearing in the background is ours. We make all the tracks that you're hearing on these episodes, and you can find them at bandcamp.com. If you want to support the channel, that's the place to do it. Otherwise, we'll see you very soon.